So we'll talk, yeah, we, we talked about this. One of the advantages they had initially, their naval forces and their land forces. Remember, essentially this is closer to Japan than it is to the United States. We're talking thousands of miles away. It's going to be difficult for us to get troops there. It's going to take time to train troops up to get them there. So it's going to be initially Japan has got to serve us there. Like if you're playing tennis, they've got to serve they can start scoring points, and they do it in, in the early years here. The other thing is their production and reinforcements will become an issue. Remember, Japan is material poor. Need steel, need oil, need all those resources. That's why they're grabbing everything they can in Asia to secure their base of manufacturing. The United States, on the other hand, that's not going to be a problem. Once we get our technology geared up and our production geared up, what will happen? We will out be able to outproduce them and out-engineer them, which is going to be essential in the, in the long run. The other thing is this is kind of a new look for us. We're not used to sustained naval operations by landing troops to take things. Most of our wars have been land-based wars. Think about World War I. Our Navy, critical in getting supplies back and forth from Europe, but how often were we deployed in huge naval battles in World War I? Not very often. So this is going to be something new to us. The other thing is we're not used to landing troops to take positions. That's going to be something new to us. And this is where we're going to get some of our experience that will lead to Lessons learned for D-Day down the road. The use of Marines, taking Marines, and landing them on these specific atolls and islands is going to be very critical. And what will work in terms of vehicles, transport, and such to get them into these places is going to be very interesting. Because a lot of these atolls and, and uh, islands, they're not going to have all the best research. And we're going to find out a couple of them they dispatch troops and they can't get them over the coral reefs with the landing craft. They're stuck out there. And the Keegan book had a very good talk about this. The number of people that were stuck out for days before they could get in an issue. And the other thing is this terrain tends to favor defenders as opposed to offenders or offensive troops. Why? Jungle. High mountains in the top, there are most of these, these islands, because they're volcanic islands, they were formed by volcanoes. So it's going to be hard to go from one side of an island to the other side. And we're going to see this repeatedly, because a lot of times these islands had five and six and seven thousand foot summits in the middle. So you have to make repeated landings from all sides of the island with different forces to try to capture these islands. And they're not very wide in some cases. I'm going to show you some maps today. Some of these islands are only 800 to 1,000, 2,000 yards wide. They're little slivers. And you wonder how they were able to put an air, the Japanese put an airstrip on a little sliver of an island. Well, it's all but an airstrip. Nothing else is hardly there. But they needed that for their campaigns and their supply and their eventual thought about bombing. Now, the United States in March of 1942 realizes they have a leadership issue. One of the issues is, how do you get people to cooperate? We've never had that level of cooperation, you know, the interfraternal fighting, Navy versus Army. It's been the longest uh, rivalry in football for a while. How many years have they been playing in academies? Better than 100 years, perhaps, in football? How do you get to two competing groups to start thinking together because they both think they do it better, right? <laughs> well, they did this by making a decision of splitting it, at least initially, into two groups. One, the Southwest being the territory of Douglas MacArthur, famous general, everybody loves him, right? Or at least they love, they think they love him, except if you work with them, I gather he was all up and no smoke. Right? Versus a very businesslike Admiral Nimitz, who was not flashy, 
very serviceable, a kind of a guy that did his homework, got the job done, was an unsung hero behind the scenes, and was loved in Washington because if you gave it to Chester, it got done. He did the job. Kind of a quiet guy. Now, remember, MacArthur comes from a very long line of, fa of family members who have been in the military. Father was a, a Medal of Honor winner. His grandfather was a, a, a soldier as well as a governor of the state of Wisconsin for four days. It's a long story behind it. It was some boat fraud in Wisconsin. Could you imagine boat fraud in Wisconsin? That's probably something. They must have been taking lessons from Chicago at that time. But they overturned the election because of boat, boat fraud. And instead of his grandfather fighting it, he just left the job. Step back. So MacArthur's always was perceived as kind of a prima donna. A little bit hard to work with. A lot of luster and a, even a little bit of detachment. Plus, you got to remember, 1934, he's retired from the service. And he went to work for the Philippine Islands as their defense secretary. He's their defense advisor. So he hasn't been in America since 1934. He's been living kind of like a Caesar in the Philippines. They love him over there, but he's out of touch with who? The American people. He doesn't understand how America operates. His vision point is kind of from the past. Now, to his credit, though, when Douglas MacArthur was given assignments, he did them, right? And he did them well, sometimes at personal cost. One of those assignments was getting rid of the bonus army from Washington. Remember 1930? World War I veterans wanted to collect their bonus that was due in 1945. Well, they wanted it in 1932. How much money was involved? $200, right? Don't have any money, 200 bucks in the Depression looks rather large. And what did they do? They marched on to Washington to get their money. Now, here's the contrast in leadership, right? Corn cob pipe versus, you know, dress blues. It's a little difference there. Okay. I talked to you about their backgrounds. One of the things, Chester Nimitz, this is a guy that has to scrap for everything he's had in life. His, grand, his father was a German immigrant who had emigrated to Texas. Could you imagine a German in Texas? Okay. German in Texas. His father was sickly. He died when the young man was very young. He was raised essentially by his mother. He realizes his only shot at a higher education is to attend a service academy. He works hard in high school. He approaches his congressman. He says, I want to go to West Point. The congressman says, I'm sorry. I gave that commission away, that appointment away. But he says, I got this other great appointment. Great for a kid from Texas. You can join the Navy. Right? So he's sent off to Annapolis, where he works very hard. Finished seventh in his class. Versus Douglas MacArthur, who was a very sharp guy, a general's kid, who finishes number one at the military academy at, at uh, West Point. So these are two smart guys, but they do it in different ways. One's quiet, unassuming, business-like. The other guy is very much blustering. 